Yeah, so this evening's talk is called The Way Back Home, and um, it's a talk about, again, another, another story from the White Lotus Sutra, this very famous Mahayana text called the White Lotus Sutra. And we've had a few talks about it so far. We had a puja related to, to the theme last week as well. But, we, but this is the penultimate talk in our kind of mini series on um, the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. We're looking at great Buddhist texts. And the Tuesday after Padmasambhava Day, we're going to be looking at Tantric Buddhism. So that's it. Padmasambhava Day is a kind of introduction into that. We've got two more talks this evening and next week on Mahayana Buddhism. So if you've been coming regularly, you'll know that Mahayana Buddhism, it was a tradition that started about 500 years after the Buddha was alive, about the same time as the Christian era. And it emerged in response to a version of Buddhism which had become a bit stagnated, a bit over-literal really. Um, and there were lots of lists which were taken, they were meant to be a guide, but the lists all became very, very literal and, and uh, it all became very kind of self-orientated Buddhism, it kind of stagnated. And last week, Satyajota really liked the way that Satyajota described it. She said that the Mahayana blew open the, 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 this kind of literal Buddhism. It blew it open with some very complex philosophy, which we heard about a few weeks ago. And it also blew it open in terms of using a more cosmic, mythic approach to telling the Dharma. It, you could call it almost like a cosmic uh, science fiction. Buddhism is a, a cosmic science fiction. So, yeah, and the, the White Lotus Sutra is one of these. Um, cosmic Mahayana text with lots of wacky and crazy things that happen in it. Um, and the Mahayana, as well as you know, using philosophy and um, its kind of cosmic science fiction, it also re, re emphasized things that were very much there but lost, become lost sight of. So, altruism and compassion, um, practice for the sake of other people, was, was re emphasized by the Mahayana. And, it, and that was something that they, it was felt to have been lost sight of. Also in the Mahayana, the nature of the Buddha is very different to what we find in the, the Pali texts. What we find in the Mahayana Sutra, these kind of these uh, Mahayana, yeah, Mahayana Sutras, the White Lotus Sutras, the Buddha, he doesn't behave like the Buddha in the Pali Canon, but he does in some ways, but also the crazy things happen, like rays of, light, of, of light, rays of light kind of come out of his forehead and, and light up the whole universe, for example. So it's very, it's, it's, the Buddha in the Pali Canon was a human being an enlightened human being. And the, the Buddha in the Mahayana Sutras is more than that. It's almost like you could say it's a, a Buddha principle. It's like a principle of, an, of awakening, an enlightened mind. And Mahayana sees that as almost being sort of an enlightened mind that we can contact, that we can tap into. It's almost like there's a principle in the universe of awakening, an awakened mind that we can tap into. So a very different vision of the Buddha than the, the kind of historical Buddha we find in the, the Pali texts. So we heard a talk from Dharma Mai um, two weeks ago where she talked about a parable of the rain cloud and an approach to, um, to Buddhism which is much more faith-based, devotion-based, um, being receptive and opening up to what's highest in the universe, the Dharma is what's highest in the universe, being receptive to that, opening up to that. Um, and it used, yeah, it used the metaphor of rain, the Dharma as being like rain that we open up to and then it causes us to grow. Uh, we grow into the, to our full potential, become the, the people we've got the potential to become. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe a little bit of context. The, the context, the background to the Mahayana Sutra as well is that the Buddha is surrounded by an assembly of beings, all kinds of different beings, but um, he's also he's part of this assembly is his, the historical disciples, as well as there being lots of kind of magical cosmic beings, the, 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 the disciples of the historical Buddha, around the Buddha. And the Buddha reveals to them that there's a teaching that they didn't know already. And this is the teaching of the Mahayana, of altruism, of compassion. And apparently 5,000 of the disciples just leave immediately because they're so upset that they, they, they can't believe there's something higher than they're already practicing. So this is a bit of a kind of critique, this, there is kind of you know, a certain type of humour in, in the White Lotus Sutra, but all the, these people are just showing it a type of approach which is just unreceptive to, to new learnings, new approaches. But once they've all gone, once those 5,000 monks go, the Buddha says, I'm going to teach the White Lotus Sutra, I'm going to teach a new, new approach to practice. Okay. What I'm going to look at this evening is I'm going to look at, well, I want to look at 
how we relate to the Dharma, how we relate to what's highest in the universe. So we've had this one parable from Dharma Maya, which is about being receptive, being open to that, and in a very devotional way, being open to the influence of the Dharma. So we've heard one parable, and this evening I want to explore two more stories from the White Lotus Sutra. There's lots of stories and parables which are really um, very potent in the White Lotus Sutra. So I want to explore two more. And yeah, I suppose I'd invite you, as I'm, as I'm telling the story, just to kind of reflect well, what, what does this teach us, or what does it say to you about the, the nature of, of how we relate to what's highest? And it's also worth saying at this point as well that you can relate to what's highest in terms of the Dharma as being something external to you, which um, you can be open to and receptive to. You can also relate to it as something that kind of comes from within you, kind of your the highest part of you, the kind of wiser part of you. And uh, both ways of relating to it are, are fine, actually. Okay, so these two parables, these two stories use a different metaphor. The, the, these stories use a metaphor of riches, um, wealth, for, for, to describe the, our spiritual potential. So I want to just emphasise, and I'll say it again later, it's not talking about um, material wealth, it's not talking about trying to become wealthy, it's not making a judgment about people who are poor. It's using this as a metaphor to say that, um, yeah, the spiritual life, and our potential, our spiritual potential, is like having a, a vast amount of riches and abundance and, and beauty and treasure. So I'll say that kind of caveat now tell the stories. So the first story is that there is a, a rich man who's got a very poor friend and they, they meet up, they, they have a chance encounter with each other and um, they go on to have a night out. It's not a kind of particularly Buddhist ethical story potentially but they go out and they, the, the poor poor man gets really drunk. He gets really really drunk so he can't really remember much about the night out. Maybe he wakes up the next morning and he remembers um, he might remember that he met his old friend, but he doesn't remember much more than that. He might remember, might remember a couple of the bars they went to, but he doesn't remember much more than that. But what happened is, the, uh, during their encounter, the rich friend had said to him, well, you don't need to be so poor. I'm going to give you this amazing, um, it's, it's a jewel which is so valuable, it's, just going, it's going to be you know, so rich, you're not going to have to worry about money anymore. And he says, what I'm going to do is, because we're, because we're a bit drunk now, I'm just going to sew it to your robe so you don't lose it. But it's there, and then in the morning you can cash it in, and you'll just be unimaginably wealthy. But of course, the next morning, the, the poor friend just remembers nothing about it. He can't remember anything about it. So he spends the next years, decades of his life just in continuing poverty, kind of going around, scratching around, trying to make a living, you know, just in very rags, wearing rags, very filthy. Until one day, he then bumps into his, his rich friend again. He says, "Well." What are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you acting in such a way? Why, why are you so poor? What's happened? What happened to you? Did you not remember? You know, did you not cash in the jewel that I gave you? The poor man said, well, what jewel? And, um, yeah, and then the, the, the rich man says, well, yeah, I, I sold a jewel into your robe, let's look. Unfortunately, the, he hasn't, he's so poor, he, didn't, he wasn't able to afford to buy a new robe, so he's still wearing the same robe with the same jewel stitched into it, and they discover the jewel. And the, the man is over, overjoyed, the poor man is overjoyed and delighted. Suddenly, he's inherited all of his riches, all of his wealth. It was there all along and just needed to, to discover it. Um, so this, this is a very brief parable that gets told in the, in the White Lotus Sutra, which suggests something about our potential, something about our potential, which is um, sometimes given the name Buddha Nature, which I'll talk more about later, but it creates the sense in which well, we, we have this potential within us, this wealth within us. But we, all, and what we need to do is just discover it. What we need to do is to be shown it, to discover it. Um, and it's just it's there waiting to be discovered. And so I'll say more about it later, but it can be an attractive way to see your potential if, if that works for you to see if there's this kind of potential waiting to, to express itself, waiting to be discovered. But there's also some dangers of seeing the, the spiritual life in that way, so I'll, I'll talk more about that later. What I want to spend most of the evening doing is, is talking and describing to you another parable that's told in the, in the Lotus Sutra, which again uses this metaphor of wealth. And I'll tell the story, and at the end we can kind of maybe compare these two stories and the two approaches, and along with the, the rain cloud, of how we can relate to our ideal, how we can discover and relate to our ideal. Okay, so the second story, again, there is um, a very rich man. 
Um, but the story begins with um, the man who has a, a son. He has a son who's a very beloved son. But one day, the story didn't say why the son runs away from home. He runs away from home and he gets lost. He gets completely separated from his father. And the father's devastated, but he tries to find him, just can't find him anywhere. And then, so the son, at quite a young age, finds himself in India with no family, no job, no training, no money, and becomes quite destitute. He ends up kind of part of the, the underclass of, of India. Uh, very, very poor, extremely poor. Um, yeah, and it's not like even our idea of poverty in our, in our country. In, in India, the poverty is really, really extreme. You know, this, this man had you know, no food, no water to wash with. He's just extremely, extremely poor. And over the years, he was just scratching around to trying to survive, and he ended up kind of yeah, becoming part of the underclass, mixing with, with poor people, spending his, his time in that kind of environment. And he, he, over time, just forgot all about his previous life. And he picked up habits um, and an identity of, of that, that kind of, that kind of um, culture, that kind of person. Really. And again, remembering this is a metaphor, it's a spiritual metaphor. Okay. So, yeah, and then meanwhile, the father um, becomes extremely rich. He's, um, he's a merchant, he's a trader, and all his investments come off, basically. He just becomes incredibly wealthy. It says he just has, he has kind of hundreds of servants, he has palaces, he has business investments across lots and lots of countries. And he is basically a massive, massive person, a really big cheese. He's just a, a very, very wealthy man, almost like a king. He lives in the world in a palace and he lives the life of a king. So many, many, many years later, many decades later, the son happens, the poor man, the son happens to be wandering through the same place where his father is dwelling. And he happens across a palace. He sees a palace that is the most beautiful building he's ever seen. He's never seen a building like it, he just kind of stumbles across it. He sees these, yeah, these amazing buildings, a bit like the Taj Mahal, there's a courtyard inside and he sees all these noble people, these aristocrats wearing these beautiful clothes like he's never seen before. And in the sense of it all, he sees this very, very rich man like a king seated on a throne, just kind of handling these thousands of pieces of gold, just like running through his hands like water, just playing with these bits of gold. And then he, he makes eye contact with this, with this man and he's, he's, he becomes quite, he becomes really frightened. He realises um, I shouldn't be in this place, this isn't for me. And he sees that he's been seen and again becomes frightened. He thinks, oh, I shouldn't be in this place. So you might, you might kind of use, you might try and connect to the, how the son might be thinking. Might think, okay, well imagine you've been doing some gardening work in this big garden and you're really sweaty and okay. And then you discover that it's Buckingham Palace Garden and there's a garden party taking place with all these famous and beautiful people and basically just want to hide, you want to not be seen, just to kind of get out of the way. Or if you've just been really trekking and you're really muddy and sweaty and then you suddenly find yourself on the red carpet at the Oscars and there's all these kind of amazing people, these beautiful people and what all you want to do is just get out of there. And that's the response that the son had, the poor man had, he just wanted to get out of there. So he turned and started to run. But of course the, the, the rich man was his father, his father instantly recognised his son and he just you know, he thought to himself, that's my son and he shouted to his guards, get him, get that man, capture that man. And so the two guards started to chase after, after the, the poor man. The poor man turned around and saw these guards chasing after him and thought, I'm in real trouble, I've done something I should have done here. And just started to leg it, he just runs as fast as he can. And the guards chase after him faster and faster. And eventually they rugby tack tackle him to the floor. And the, the man, the poor man, is absolutely terrified, thinks I've done something wrong, I'm going to be punished. So he starts kicking and screaming and the guys are trying to hold on to him. And eventually he just faints, he's so terrified of what's going to happen to him. He just faints and passes out. So the, the, the rich man realises this approach isn't going to work, this approach isn't going to work with my son. I can't just invite my son back to the palace to have some kind of caviar and um, you know, just have champagne with me. It's just not going to work. He's just too terrified. I need a different kind of strategy. I need some kind of approach that's going to help me to make some connection with my son. So he finds out where the son is staying, kind of this hovel, this shack where the son is staying. And he sends two different servants to go and meet him. And it's said that he chooses the two lowliest servants that he, have, he has so that the son will feel more, less threatened by them. So it says that the servants are a, uh, let's find the correct 
relatives. They are of a doleful and undignified appearance, one-eyed and squat. So yeah, so you can imagine these kind of one-eyed squat servants <laughs> going to meet the son. What they do is they offer the son a job. They say to him, basically, we've got a great job for you. It's shoveling human waste, human manure out of the toilets at this palace. And guess what? We're going to pay you double wages. So the son is absolutely delighted because this is the kind of work he's, he's used to doing. He's, he's used to this kind of work, but it's double pay, double wages. So at once he accepts. He says, yes, I really want to do this. So the son starts to work at the palace. Um, he starts to, to, to yeah, just do this really filthy job, just shoveling all this human manure and doing this day after day after day. Um, yeah, and it's dirty work, but the son is delighted because he's getting double pay. It's kind of, it's, yeah, it's on the level he's used to. And meanwhile, the father, the, the rich man, can see from his window, he looks down where the son is working, and he just longs to reconnect with his son. He really wants to be able to reconnect with his son, but he knows he's going to need a strategy to try to, to help raise his son, his, his son's kind of self-esteem and, and his, his, his consciousness. So what he decides to do is he, he dresses in some kind of rough clothing and he kind of muckies himself up a bit. And he goes down and he prevent, pretends to be the supervisor of the foreman. And he tells the, the son he's a new foreman, um, the, the foreman. And what he does is he's quite strict to start with, he's quite severe, saying, hey you, shovel that there, come on, work faster, work harder than you. And he's quite, because this is what the son would expect, he'd expect the foreman to be really strict and severe with him. So the son's quite happy to that, he, he works hard. So this, this goes on again for some while. And um, after a while, the, the, the supervisor, the man, says to the son, you know, I'm taking a liking to you. You work hard, you're an honest, you're an honest man. Um, you, know, you, you stick with me and I'll look after you. So it starts to develop a, a relationship with, with the, the poor man. And this goes on further and after all he says, actually, you know, I, I consider you like a son. I consider you like a son of mine. And he reveals to him, actually, he isn't, he isn't only the, um, the supervisor, but actually he's the owner of this palace. And this, you know, the son isn't too shocked by this, he's not too bowled over by this because he's, he's got a connection with this guy and he knows this man, so he says, okay, yeah, um, you, know, you can treat me like, you know, and you can treat me like a son if you want to. And the, and the, um, the owner, the rich man, even gives him a new name to kind of mark this kind of new identity. And he starts to allow the, the son to kind of start to come into the palace, to spend time in the palace. So it gives him more responsibility, it gives him jobs that involve him having to come in and out of the palace. And the, um, yeah, the, after time, the poor man, he starts to get used to being in the palace and being around all these beautiful treasures and these pieces of works of art, these beautiful people. Uh, he gets more and more used to it, but instead, that at night time, he's, 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 just, he's only comfortable going back to his hovel. He wants to go back into his dirty hovel because he feels that's where he belongs and he doesn't really belong in the palace. So, yeah, this, this continues for longer and longer, and the... Um, the father's continuing to kind of deepen his connection with, it, with, with the poor man, with the son. And um, after a while, you can see that the, 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 the son's self-esteem and image is starting to, to, become, to become greater, to become better, to, to be raised. And he says to the son, well, actually, I've got a new job for you. Um, I want you to, to be my steward. I want you to handle my business affairs. I want you to handle all my, my treasures and my riches and to handle my negotiations. I'm getting old and I want to step back a bit. I want you to take charge in a way to become my steward. So now the um, yeah the son's gone from going, being kind of very lowly to being in a place of great responsibility, a really important person. He's, he's now in charge of the palace, in charge of all of the, the riches and the affairs. And the man's getting very old now. The rich man's getting really old, and he says to to the to the son, to the poor man, um, I'm going to arrange a big party. I've got a big announcement to make. So I want you to arrange this party, get all the, like, all the noble people from around the area, go this big, huge feast, and I've got this really big announcement to make. So then at the end, yeah, so at the, the culmination of the story is that the rich man throws this party, and then he announces to everybody, this man is my son, this is my actual son, this is my real son, and he inherits everything I own, everything I own belongs to, to this man, this is my son. And the son is absolutely amazed. He just had no idea that this was the case. But he's also absolutely delighted. He's amazed and delighted. And he says something like, well, all this has come to me. I haven't done anything to earn it. It's all just come to me. 
So, yeah, so that's, that's the second story. It's the story of the, sometimes called the return journey or the parable of the, the rich man and the son. So, yeah, what's that story about? And I think, um, yeah, and later what I want to do is contrast that story with the story of the, the drum man who has the jewel sewing in his robe. We're just exploring and kind of say, what, what do these, these stories tell us about how we relate to our potential, how we relate to what's highest, the Dharma and the Buddha and our, our own potential? So in this story, it might be quite obvious, but the, the father is, is this Buddha principle in the Mahayana, this, this principle of the enlightened mind or the Dharma as this kind of force that's trying to get us to wake up, trying to get us to grow, trying to kind of call on us and invite us to, to grow and to wake up. And the sun is us, we are the sun. The sun is a spiritual practitioner. So this is a story about the spiritual life. It's a description of the spiritual life, what it's like to try and practice and grow. So to be with a poor man, us, is alienated from his true nature, his real nature. He doesn't know he's a rich man's son and he thinks he's poor, he's got this kind of, this kind of way of living and this, this view of himself which is very impoverished, um, spiritually impoverished, I would say. So again, just to re-emphasize, it's not making any judgment about rich and poor people, this is a metaphor. And what he's saying is that, um, yeah, there's a way of life which probably we're living which is, is impoverished compared to the riches and the abundance of what, what it could be like, what our life really could be like. Um, yeah, maybe we are like that, maybe we're living in a kind of more impoverished way spiritually. Maybe we've got lots of habits, ways of thinking, feeling, acting, which, which are beneath us a bit, or which demean us, or they don't become us. It's like we're living in a, a spiritual poverty, where we could be living in a world of spiritual riches and abundance. So we develop lots of habits and ways of thinking that cut us off from our potential, cut us off from the Dharma, cut us off from all these riches and abundance and wealth. Um, I just spent a little time reflecting on my own habits and actions, I won't go into them to kind of save me embarrassment, but um, there's ways that I act and behave selfishly or when I act on craving, and I really, I do experience it like it kind of shrinks my consciousness, it really makes my experience of life more impoverished. It's so, I've become cut off from other people, I've become cut off from, from the Dharma, from inspiration, and the world just seems duller, it seems flatter, it seems duller, and just less, less abundant, less rich. I feel poor as a result of my, my habitual actions, my habitual behaviour. Some of the ways we think habitually can cut us off from riches, cut us off from abundance. So we heard a couple of weeks ago about the, kind of the materialistic way of seeing the world as being like a dead machine. I mean, that kind of worldview, it's just very, very dull actually, very, very boring, there's not a lot, it's possible, there's no, no spiritual wealth, no spiritual potential in that kind of way of seeing the world. So, yeah, maybe we're, or we are like the sun, in this parable we are like the sun, we're living in a, in a more impoverished way spiritually. And perhaps when we first encounter the Dharma, or we first get a glimpse of our true potential spiritually, maybe it frightens us in a way that the sun is frightened when he first sees it, gets a glimpse of, of his father in, in his full glory, all the magnificent, magnificence of his father. It terrifies him. So it might be you've had an experience like that where you just had a glimpse of maybe of reality, you've had a glimpse of um, your own potential and it frightens you, or the fact that you're going to need to change, the, the, the implications of change might frighten you or, or scare you. And sometimes people you know, stop coming to the Buddhist centre because of, because of that, because of the fear of having to change it, because it's just too much, it's overwhelming for them. They, they know it's right, they know it's true, but they just, they just can't. There's a fear there, there's a kind of fear of change and the implications. Sometimes when people speak in a kind of kind way to us, speak positively to us, it feels a bit uncomfortable, like we, kind of, we don't belong there, we, just, you know, we want to kind of get out of our situation. I remember when I first started coming to the Buddhist Centre, friends um, would speak really positively to me and I just couldn't hear it, I just had to kind of close off from it, shut off from it, it was just too uncomfortable because of my own kind of impoverished view of myself. So sometimes, yeah, maybe because we live in a place of poverty, what's most beautiful in the world might seem threatening, might seem scary to us in a way that the, the father and his, his beautiful palace seem threatening to, to his son. 
And another thing that came to my mind, an experience that came to my mind, was of um, meeting Pat Mavatra, who is um, our president, and he's coming in a few weeks to, to give a talk and spend a week here. But he's a big hero of mine, a big spiritual hero of mine. And um, I just really, really, you know, when he spoke, the Dharma, it's like Dharma would shine through him, and he would give a Dharma talk, and it would be really amazing, really inspired. Um, and I just like, I, you know, I've again got a bit of a kind of um, spiritual crush on Papa Vajra, but I wanted to be around him, I wanted to kind of be in his kind of presence. But whenever I kind of came close to him, I just couldn't speak to him, I was just kind of frightened to speak to him. This happened with Ratnaguna at my first order convention as well, like a real, you know, Ratnaguna, he came up and said something to me, I just froze and kind of just ignored him and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so frightened, so it was like the, the kind of the sun just running away, I just didn't, I kind of too frightened to be around somebody that seemed so inspiring, so awesome to me. And it's interesting, a bit like Padma Vajra knew what to do, a bit like the kind of the father kind of dressing in, in rags and dirty himself up a bit, it just kind of, it met me at my level where they just said, well, you know, let's just go out and look at some second-hand shops and food meal. Let's, let's go out and have a coffee, let's talk about football. So it was then I just talked about football with me all the time. We talked about Spurs, that was his team, and Liverpool, which is my team. We didn't talk about the Dharma at all, but after a while I just got kind of used to being in his company. And then you know, after some time we could talk about deeper things and more important things, but initially just kind of, he needed to meet me where I was at and at the level I was at. Really. And then there's the kind of one-eyed squat, I um, can't remember the terminology now, but the, the kind of servants of the, of the king, maybe the servants of the Dharma. So who might they be? Or maybe, maybe they're the order members, maybe they're, <laughs> maybe they're the, um, the squat one-eyed servants of the Dharma. You know, they're just trying to do our best to put the message of the, of the true riches of the Dharma across, maybe in a way that kind of might seem attractive to the level that we're all at, but actually, yeah, maybe it's much more rich and much more magnificent than that. Yeah, some of us are less squatting one eye than others, but... <laughs> <laughs> so to get us interested, the Dharma needs to kind of meet our level, the Dharma needs to speak to us at the level where we're at now. Um, maybe we can't really imagine what the Dharma is going to be like in six years or ten years or what we're going to be like. We can't really, maybe it frightens us our potential or we just can't imagine it. So the Dharma needs to speak to us and entice us and make us an offer of double wages for basically doing what we're used to, the kind of the, the kind of ordinary impoverished kind of stuff we're used to, but just with an extra reward. It just, you know, so maybe maybe you're new to the centre now, maybe you're coming up, maybe you've been coming a while, but it might be worth reflecting what. What did you first think you were coming for when you came to the Buddhist Centre? Has it changed since then? What were you first looking for? Um, was it maybe just make yourself a bit better, kind of live in the same way as you were, but maybe a little bit better, a bit calmer, a bit less stressed or something? Maybe, you know, has that changed? Has your vision of what's possible become richer or deeper, more abundant since then? You know, mine certainly has. Um, yeah. So maybe, yeah, so the Dharma, in a way, it can't really, it can't, we can't, yeah, the Dharma can't reveal itself into its full magnificence, its full abundance. It would just be terrifying for us, but actually, gradually, bit by bit, the Dharma, um, you know, the Dharma becomes more apparent, becomes more real, reveals more of itself, the more depth, the more beauty of it. And we're able, gradually, we're able to receive it, to kind of, um, yeah, to, to, to receive that. But then the poor man gets this job with um, double pay, shifting these piles of human waste, these piles of manure, basically, for years and years and years and years. And um, yeah, that as well has been my big part of my experience of the Dharma life, is just um, shoveling lots and lots and lots of smelly old habits and kind of clearing them up and kind of just, yeah, basically doing that again and again and again, finding himself, keep repeating the same ethical mistakes, making the same mess the same kind of manure and then keep cleaning it up again and again and again. So there's a, there's a whole stage of the spiritual life where we need to put a lot of effort into purifying and changing, transforming <coughs> our habits. And this, this, you know, this, is, um, this is a big part of spiritual life. Maybe the modern life and the kind of the, um, there's an attraction to think we can get a quick result, we can kind of get something from the internet or a book that's going to make us enlighten quickly or grow quickly. Actually, sooner or later, we realise we need to realise that in order to make progress, we need to come back and just work on all these layers of, of 
crap, basically, all this kind of stuff that we've built up. It's basically it's karmic work over years of built up karmic habits. And there's no bypassing that or skipping that. We just need to spend a lot of time covered in crap, basically. Shoveling all of this and all and cleaning it all out. Yeah. And maybe to begin with, the Dharma or the Buddha seems strict, like a supervisor saying to you, well, you, know, don't, you can't drink five pints of lager or five cocktails or this, or you've got to go on a treat and be in silence, go to bed at nine o'clock and be, <laughs> be in silence, or get up at six and do two meditations and meditate every day. So it seems kind of quite strict or severe or limiting the kind of practice of, of the ethics or, or, or Buddhist practice. But actually, it's what we need. We need that kind of, you know, we need to really transform our habits, transform these kind of impoverished habits and these, these views of ourselves. Over time, the, the Buddha, the Dharma becomes more friendly, like this, the supervisor transforms, you know, the, 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 the man in the story becomes, first of all, a boss, then he becomes a father figure, and eventually a foster father, and then he's, you know, his real, his real father. But while they're sort of busy, you know, in amongst all that manure, shifting all the, the human waste, covering the book of our old habits, the Dharma gradually introduces us to the riches and the treasures and the beauty that we're heir to. So it gradually refines us, the Dharma gradually refines our emotions and our mental states and our views. It gradually teaches us, and it raises our level of consciousness, raises our level of being and our self-esteem. So we can start to identify it like we're being a, like we're a son or daughter of the Buddha. That's our kind of true identity, our true inheritance. We're, we're a son or daughter of that, this great lineage of practitioners. So we, we, we can, might get a new identity, maybe even a new name, like the son in this, in this story. And then we can spend time in the palace, we can spend time with that beauty, spend time with the riches and the beauty of the Dharma. When we transform our, our consciousness, our, our mind, it might be in meditation, you know, meditations where it's, it's like you're just dwelling in this, this place of beauty, of a great palace. But it might be experiences of being on retreat where you get a glimpse of your future potential, like where you could be you know, further down the line. That used to be my experience. I'd go on retreat for a weekend or maybe longer, like a week, and suddenly everything would just work better. My consciousness was working better. I was, I was, I was more ethical. My meditations were going deeper. And then I'd come back home again, and it was like my old habits were bite again. And it's almost given me a glimpse of what it would be like in six months' time or a year's time. If I just carried on doing the work, shoveling them in the new old habits, then that would be my next level of consciousness, the next kind of stage. It's given me a glimpse. So you can start to spend time in the palace of riches and abundance of, 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 the, of the Dharma. But maybe for a while we're living in these two levels. We kind of we spend time in the palace, but we still feel more comfortable. In our kind of smelly hovel, in our kind of what, our old identity, it feels more comfortable to us. And for a long time, it's, it just it's felt like that for me that there's a kind of almost like a, a tussle between a new identity and an old identity, kind of new habits and old habits. And kind of for a long time, I feel more comfortable with identi identifying more with our kind of older, smellier habits. They feel more comfortable to us. And again, I won't go into the, my personal personal details of that. But I'm sure we've all got our equivalents of the things that. Yeah, we feel impoverished, but they just feel more comfortable to us sometimes. We kind of cling to them. We want to kind of dwell and go back to our hovel. Um, yeah, sometimes it might be like the positivity, like I said it before, the positivity of the Sangha in the centre might just seem a bit overwhelming. You know, we could spend time in those, around those kind of more positive environments or in these higher states, but um, sometimes it feels like apart from what's a sabotage, it wants to sabotage the kind of growth and the abundance because it's just it's just too much actually and I want to kind of go back to my kind of smelly, more comfortable um, and skillful habits. It's, and, um, there's another story, I can't remember what tradition it comes from, but it's a story of a lady who sells fish. And she's on the way to, to market one day to sell fish. But on the way home she realises she's just missed her at the time and it's too late, it's getting get dark and the road isn't going to be safe. So she's not going to be able to go home, but she's got this basket of fish that she hasn't sold. But one of her friends is the lady who sells flowers at the market. And the lady with the flower store says, why don't you come into my, my home and sleep you know, with the flowers downstairs? So the fish lady is really grateful. She says, okay, great, I'll come and, I'll come and stay the night in your, in your house with, with all the flowers. But what she finds is it's so, it's, it's, the smell is so beautiful, actually, all the flowers, that she can't stand it. You know, she's just so used to the smell of fish. The smell of all these beautiful flowers is just, it's just uncomfortable for her. She does, she can't sleep, she can't settle. So she has to bring the basket of fish into the room and just kind of curl up next to the 
basket of fish so that she can feel comfortable and go to sleep. So I think this again, it kind of, it's a similar message that we, maybe, I, I remember a friend of mine, Savannah Garber, I thought this is a really, kind of, really kind of damning um, indictment of kind of where I was at, that I needed this kind of smelly basket. But Savannah Garber said, actually, the smelly basket helps you to go into the flower shop without the kind of comfort of kind of that old identity. You can't start to go into the, into the palace and have this kind of new, richer, abundant identity. So there's a, and the fish basket is important. Even though it stinks, it stinks of fish. <laughs> so over time, yeah, we, we, yeah, over time, what happens in the Dharma life is that we just eventually we can just let go of that old identity, we can let go of that old, those old habits. We no longer need to shovel the manure, we don't need to dwell in the, in the hovel anymore, we can just dwell, we we'll spend all the time in this palace of riches and beauty and abundance. And then over gradually, eventually, we inherit, we inherit all. All of the beauty, all of the wealth, all of the riches of the Dharma, the Kamalas. That's the, the goal, that's the aim of the spiritual life. Um, so maybe a couple of questions for myself and maybe for you. What, what, is, what is the spiritual wealth? What are the spiritual riches? Um, yeah, so a very quick answer. Just, just Well, for me, it's the kind of mental states, the inner emotional states that we start to develop when our consciousness becomes more refined, more positive, more altruistic. It just feels like we dwell in these very, very abundant, rich in a, in a mental states, and um, it's the vision of the world that you can you can have, that you can dwell in, just a beautiful world full of beautiful people, full of riches and beauty, blissful experiences. Yeah, and as I say, I've had experience of this on, on retreats and after certain meditations as well, and a general, yeah, a general sense of my consciousness is becoming more, or less and less smelly. Let's say more and more, more and more beautiful, more and more abundant. That has been my experience. And then this question that I, um, I kind of hinted at at the start, which is like, well, what, how do we relate to our potential? How do we relate to this wealth and this riches? Do we relate to it as something um, that we already possess, like the, the drunk man? So the parable of the drunk man suggests that we already possess this wealth, this riches. Whereas the parable of the um, the return journey, the father and the son, suggests that well, actually, we've become separated from it. We need help, we need guidance, we need to be gradually, we need to do a lot of work to inherit this, the riches. So it's like the, the, the kind of king, the, the father is an external, it's an external dynamic we're relating to what's highest, the Dharma, there's something outside of us that's guiding us, helping us. Um, and again, it could be like the parable of the rain, where we're just opening up, being receptive to the Dharma and the effect that the Dharma has on us. Um, so at this stage, I, I had intended to have a flip chart. I don't, I don't have a flip chart because I uh, left it a bit late. So just imagine there's a flip chart just here. And the flip chart says um, three levels, three models of the spiritual life by Sabuti. So there's an order member called Sabuti who is um, a very senior order member, inspiring order member. Somebody that, again, it would come in the category of if I met him, I'd be terrified. But, um, but you know, imagine a really nice man as well. Not, not a terrifying man, but a very nice man. But just so inspiring and awesome. That I would find it scary, actually. But he needs to come up with a model of um, yeah, three three ways to move towards Buddha Buddha. Three three kind of models of, of the spiritual life. So the first model he calls self development. Um, so you can imagine that's written first on the on the chart, self development. And that is where I do all the work. I put all in, in all the work. And I grow. I develop myself. I do the practices. I grow. I develop my my, my mental states. My consciousness. And then the second model is called self, I'm calling self-discovery, which is a bit more like the parable of the, the drunk man. You, you discover something, a potential, and all you need to do is, is let it unfold, you need to allow it to unfold, you discover potential and you need to allow it to unfold. And then the third model is called self-surrender, which is where you just you approach the spiritual life as you just let go, you completely surrender to something higher than yourself. And it moves you forward, it guides you, and it moves you forward. Um, so, interesting, I, I think the, uh, the three different parables contain these three different models. The parable of the rain cloud is about self surrender, it's about opening up to the Dharma, being receptive to the Dharma, just allowing the Dharma to, to feed us, to nourish us, to let us grow, to make us grow. And then the parable of the drunk man and the, um, the rich friend with a Jewel sewn in his robe, that's a long title. I don't know what the, the, 
a short title. But the, the parable of the jewel in the road, maybe. Um, it's all about discovering the, the, the guy in that story just discovers his wealth, discovers his riches. And it's just like, yes, I've just discovered it. Oh, I'm, I'm cured, I'm, I'm, I'm rich now, I'm no longer poor. This is moment of discovery. Um, and that could be, yeah, that's, that's similar to what in, in Zen is called Buddha nature, this idea that we have this, in Zen they call it nature, which can be a bit dangerous as well. It could relate to it as a potential, we have this potential, and uh, we just need to discover it and um, allow it to unfold. So you could call this self-discovery. And also at the end of the, the, the last story I told you, the return journey, the sun says, well, I've just inherited all this wealth, all these riches, and I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to do anything at all. I just, I just inherited it all, it just came to me. Um, so this, this idea of, of Buddha nature can be taken the wrong way. It can be a really, really inspiring idea that fits in with our experiences. Oh, there's something within us kind of just trying to manifest, trying to express itself. Um, calling us on, you know, calling us on, we can maybe feel it on the streets of meditation. So this it can be a metaphor, a way of relating to that experience, but um, sometimes it does get interpreted as, well, all I need to do is just relax, all I need to do is re realise my Buddha nature and then relax and the, the rest of it will, will happen. So there's a kind of stereotypical Californian Zen approach which is just, hey man, I'm a Buddha, I'm already a Buddha. Um, all I need to do is relax, I don't need to make any effort, I don't need to practice the precepts. Um, yeah, I just need to relax. And it is true, there's an element of just relaxing into, into growth. But you do that on the basis of lots and lots of effort that you've put in previously, lots and lots of conditions that you've set up. And then you can relax and allow the fruits to unfold. But if you just relax without doing any effort, you're in for trouble really. You're, going to, you're just deluding yourself with it. So the son, yeah, the son at the end inherited all this wealth and it seemed effortless. But he spent years and years and years and years doing hard manual labor, labor hard graft really. And, and over time just gradually refining his, his inner states and his, his view of himself and his, his view of life. So he put loads and loads of effort in him and eventually right at the end he did, he did just effortlessly inherit all of this wealth. But it was only because of all the, all the effort he put in. So it does seem like self-development seems like a more realistic approach. Um, you know, we need to do more than just remember we've got a jewel sewn into our robe. We need to we need to do a lot of work. We need to work on ourselves. And this is the, the approach that we, we follow largely in Tree Ratna, that we, you know, we we you know we do a lot of work with meditation ethics, practice, we transform ourselves. And it fits in with you know a kind of popular idea of Buddhism in the West, which is kind of non-religious, secular, you know, we just develop ourselves, we develop our, our minds, our state of our state of mind. But again, that's dangerous, that's got a danger to it because um, it's not, it's just not, that's not all there is to it. So there's a danger of just being too literal about self-development as well. Because it isn't just us doing all the work. Um, it isn't just the son who does all the work. There's a relationship with something higher with, with the father. The, the, the father is, is making efforts all the time. There's kind of a longing to, to, to connect with the son, to, to draw the son on, to, to meet the son at his level, to come up with this, this strategy. So that the father is really kind of behind it all. The son does all the work. It's being led, it's been guided by, by the Father. So, you know, whether it's your nature, your potential inside of you, whether, I mean, I prefer to relate to the Dharma as a force, an active force, something that's alive in the universe that I'm, I'm cooperating with, but either way is fine. But basically, um, if it's just you developing yourself, again, you're going to stay impoverished because we can only imagine a very poor version of ourselves. You know, we've got a like, spiritually impoverished version to start with. We can't imagine a great deal more than that. All we can imagine is that a little bit better. So if it's just us doing that, we're not going to get very far. We need to, we need to be open to something outside of us, something we can't imagine, something we don't know. Yeah, and there is something higher than just karmic work happening as well in the Dharma life. We need to be open to, to the Dharma, to the influence of the Dharma leading us in the direction of our potential, kind of tugging at our, our intuitions, tugging at our heartstrings. It might be a very faint intuition that we kind of hear in, in certain conditions, kind of sometimes often drowned out by the busyness of life, but um, you know, we need to be receptive to this kind of wise voice, whether it's from within us or from outside of us. Um, maybe a longing to, to be more noble, to serve something more noble. So maybe there's another reflection, maybe you could look back at your 
your Dharma life so far and, and just see what has it, has it felt like? Coincidences or something that's been kind of drawing you along? Has it been an intuition? Has it been what has it been? What has it been that's going to let you here? Has it was it just accident or has it been does it feel like there might have been um, yeah, something like um, the rich man trying to draw out our potential, whether it's your calling and urge from within or something else? So you can reflect on that. Um, yeah, so what I would say is that we're, I think we're in a better position than the sun in this story because um, yeah, we, know, we know that we're on a path, we've got this awareness that we're on a path, we're on a journey. We're, at times we are aware of the Dharma, it's, we are inspired by the Dharma at times. This kind of, yeah, this, this Dharma is inspirational, kind of, the Dharma which is like it, something alive in the universe. So that, that is, it might seem like a strange way of talking about the Dharma, but that is my way of relating to the Dharma. So the Sangharachita says the Dharma isn't taught, it's caught. And that's a really useful aphorism, a very powerful aphorism. So we do teach the Dharma intellectually, but it's not something that's taught, it's actually something you catch. It's a, maybe a, an inspiration or a spirit or a kind of an atmosphere. The Dharma is something that you catch from relating to other people that have got that inspiration. So it's not just something that is taught, the Dharma is caught. Yeah, when I first encountered the Dharma, I can remember just feeling, yeah, just exhilarated, excited, just this kind of electrifying response of hearing Dharma talks. And it might have been kind of, well, for me now, it's not, it might be like a one eyed spot. Or I remember trying to present the Dharma, but something that the Dharma could shine through and it can be electrifying, exhilarating, this kind of truth can shine through and the attempts to express it. So our job is to do the work, our job is to do the work that makes us more likely to catch the Dharma and to become effective with it. So by working on our old impoverished ha habits and views of ourselves, by purifying ourselves, shifting that manure, we can raise our consciousness to higher and higher levels, we can raise our self-esteem, we can become a son or daughter of the Buddha. We can begin to enter the palace of riches, the palace of the Dharma, and eventually inherit the wealth of complete awakening which I relate to as boundless energy, an unlimited heart of kindness, and total wisdom and clarity of understanding. 